Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you've all recovered from last week's case because, oh my God, that one was a lot. So today we're going to be covering the murder of Annie Dewani and I have been aware of this case ever since it happened. It happened in 2010 and it was a huge case in the UK. It did happen in South Africa but one of the people involved in the case was a British man so it was huge over here in the UK. It was in the media a hell of a lot. So I was aware of this case when it happened but then recently a four-part documentary came out called The Honeymoon Murder. It came out back in November I think it was. I watched it of course and oh my god I was not aware of how complex this case was. So as soon as I watched that documentary I was left with more questions than answers so I was like okay I have to do a video on this case. So that is what we're doing today. And the case does take place in South Africa. So we're going to be visiting South Africa for the first time on this channel. When Annie was murdered, she was on her honeymoon in South Africa. She had recently just gotten married to Shreyan Dewani, who was a millionaire businessman from the UK. And let's just say there were a lot of question marks around Shreyan. Um, <laughs> to say the least, which we will of course try and unpack in today's case. And I say try because I still feel like after doing all of my research, I have so many questions about this case with no answers. I definitely want to hear all of your thoughts in the comments down below, like especially on this case, like I want to know all of your theories. But before we do get onto today's case, we do have a sponsor. So we're just going to quickly jump into that. So I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is Hunter Killer. Now, have you guys heard of Hunter Killer? It is amazing and I'm sure some of you are already Hunter Killer subscribers. But if you don't know what Hunter Killer is, it is a murder mystery subscription game delivered right to your door. So you can solve this murder, this fiction fictitious murder from the comfort of your own home. And I am so excited to be sharing Hunter Killer with you guys because it truly is one of the most unique games I have ever played and it's perfect for all of us that are obsessed with true crime. So with every delivery, you'll get to sift through piles of documents and evidence. You'll get to listen, like actually listen to audio recordings. You get physical pieces of evidence as well. So you can eliminate suspects, identify suspects, identify murder weapons until you crack the case. And it's just such a fun game to play it is a challenge though like it's not easy at all it definitely gives your brain a workout because when you get your box and you unbox everything and you have all of these documents and all of this evidence you think where the hell do I even start? And it's actually pretty realistic. It's probably the closest I'll ever get to actually being a detective. And it's also the perfect game to get everyone involved as well. It's the perfect way to spend time with family members, with friends, with a partner for like a date night. And it's also a really good way to get you away from a screen, get you away from the TV, get you away from your phone, from your laptop. So if that is one of your New Year's resolutions to spend less time staring at a screen, well then Hunter Killer is the perfect game for you. And did did you guys know that Hunter Killer is not just a subscription service? You can purchase one-off games and box sets from their store. So there are many ways to try out Hunter Killer. So if you guys wanted to try out Hunter Killer, go to hunterkiller.com forward slash Danielle and use the code Danielle at checkout and that will save you $10 off your purchase. Again, that is code Danielle to save you $10. And also one of my favorite things about Hunter Killer is that part of the proceeds from every single box goes to the Cold Case Foundation, which is an organization that is dedicated to helping real life cold cases, which I just think is absolutely incredible. So I highly recommend that you guys check out Hunter Killer, get your little detective hat on, let's solve all of these crimes. And it's just so much fun, like it really is. So thank you again to Hunter Killer for sponsoring today's video, but thank you to every single one of you watching right now, because without all of you, I wouldn't have opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case, which we are all gonna need our detective hats for. So Shreya Dewani was born on the 29th of December, 1979, making him a Capricorn and he lived in Bristol which is just a city in the UK with his parents and older brother. Before he was born his parents did emigrate to the UK. His mom was from Uganda and his dad from Kenya and after emigrating to the UK Shrian's dad started his own healthcare business which provided healthcare for the elderly and he also owned a string of care homes in the UK as well. Now Shrian had a pretty privileged upbringing. He attended a very elite private school in Bristol before he went on to attend the University of Manchester. And after he graduated from the University of Manchester, he did move to London to work for one of the big accounting companies. He worked for Deloitte. He only worked there for a short amount of time though before returning to Bristol to help with the family business. And the family business was growing pretty quickly and Shrian 
threw himself into the business. And throughout Shreyan's 20s, the family business was thriving. It was growing bigger and bigger. And a lot of this was because of the work and effort that Shreyan was putting in. And by the time Shreyan turned 30, he was already a millionaire. So he had money, money, okay? Not just money, he had money, money. And it was around this time when he was 30 years old that he did meet Annie. Annie, at the time of meeting Trian, was 27 years old. She was born on the 12th of March, 1982, and she was born in Sweden. Annie's parents emigrated to Sweden from Uganda before Annie was born, which is a very similar story to Trian. And Annie lived with her parents and brother and sister in Sweden. And when Annie's family emigrated to Sweden, Annie's dad started up his own business. So Annie, after graduating college, she did move to Stockholm because she was going to work for the mobile phone company Ericsson. And as Annie entered into her mid-20s, she wanted to find her partner. She wanted to find that person that she was going to spend the rest of her life with. She wanted to find a husband. And she began dating to try and find the one, but she wasn't really having that much luck. Now, Annie's family did have a lot of family in London. So Annie decided that she was going to travel back and forth to London to maybe meet someone in London. And she would spend many weekends in London, staying with family and going out at the weekends, socializing, having fun. And this is when she met Shreyan. So the two of them reportedly hit it off straight away. And after they first met, they immediately arranged a second date. And for their second date, not that this is very important, but I just kind of find these things interesting. For their second date, they went to see The Lion King, the West End show, which I think is a pretty good date. I actually want to go see The Lion King. I've never seen The Lion King at the West End before. This soon led to the third date, to the fourth date. They were going to many dates and we know Shreyan has money money so a lot of these dates they were going to really fancy hotels and restaurants and soon because they were hitting it off so well Annie was thinking oh my god this might be the one like he he seems pretty good and this is when she told her sister she was like I think I think this might be the one like things are going very very well Annie just completely fell for Shreyan she completely fell for his personality he was a very caring person which not a lot of people really did see because Shreyan we know he has money money I'm going to be saying that a lot in this video a lot of people saw him as kind of like a show off he kind of liked to brag and show his wealth but Annie saw right through that. She saw his true personality and he was very caring. He was very funny. He was just a really nice, fun guy to be around and she completely fell for him. Their relationship was moving pretty quickly because in February, 2010, just a few months into their relationship, Annie moved to London to be with Shreyan. So that is how much she fell for Shreyan. She just packed up and left and moved to a different country. So then it is now spring 2010 and it is the time for the families, the two families to meet each other, which is always a pretty nerve wracking thing. And Annie's family flew over from Sweden to Bristol to meet Shreyan's family. And when Annie's family arrived at Shreyan's parents' house, they were like, oh, my God, I didn't realize they had this much money because it was a huge house, it was. But they also had all of these cars outside of the house as well. They had Mercedes, they had Porsches, uh, BMWs. They had all of these fancy ass cars outside lined up and Annie's family were just like, I knew they had money, but I didn't know they had this kind of money. And when they first arrived, they were really intimidated by all of this money. But Shreyan's family were really nice. They were really welcoming. They weren't like stuck up or anything like that. They didn't shove their money in people's faces. And they made Annie's family feel at home pretty much instantly. And the two families hit it off, which is always a good thing, isn't it? So pretty much instantly after the families met, Shreyan whisked Annie off to an airfield where they got on a private plane. Yes, I'm not joking here. They had money, money. So they took a private plane to Paris and then at a fancy restaurant in Paris, a waiter approaches the table with a silver platter. And when Annie looks at the waiter, she looks at this silver platter. What is on this silver platter? A single red rose with an engagement ring, like balanced on the rose. And guess how much this engagement ring was? I, I honestly, I have no words. This engagement ring was 25,000 pounds, which is just ridiculous. 
That is a ridiculous amount of money. I just, I can't believe it. And I think Annie was a bit uh, overwhelmed as well. I think anyone would be. And she said, yes, their relationship was moving very quickly. I mean, they'd only been dating for like six months max at this point, And they already set a wedding date. They were going to get married in October of 2010. They're getting married very, very quickly. I don't exactly know when they met, but they've met and married within like a year. And the couple decided that they wanted to get married in Mumbai in India. So running up to the wedding, the two of them pretty much lived in a hotel room in Mumbai to plan this wedding, which again, I think just paints the picture of how much money Shreyan's family have, because who can afford to just go and live in another country, <laughs> not work, because it's like, how is Annie working? How is Shreyan working from a different country? I mean, I suppose you can work from home. I mean, I feel like the pandemic has proven that people can work from home, but I feel like this just shows the privilege lifestyle that Shreyan has. So you're probably thinking like, yes, this relationship has moved very fast, but when you know, you know, it's clearly a whirlwind relationship and they're clearly in love. Well, uh, things are not always that straightforward, are they? So in the months and weeks leading up to the wedding, Annie was phoning and texting her friends and family, telling them just how unhappy she was. And she said a countless amount of times that she wanted to call off the wedding. She would send texts like, I don't want to marry him. I'm going to be unhappy for the rest of my life. I can't even hug him. We have nothing in common. She would also say that she would cry every single day because of how unhappy she was. And she even said that she hated Shreyan. And in another text that she sent, she said that she wanted to cry herself to death. And it's very easy to think like, are they just pre-wedding jitters? Like, is she just having slight doubts? But no, it didn't seem like that because these texts and calls were constant. It was week after week after week after week that Annie was sending these texts and making these phone calls to her friends and family. Annie just said that Shreyan was pretty controlling and they just did not get on. They had nothing in common and that they were always just fighting and arguing. And then there was another huge problem in the relationship and that was that Annie wanted to be intimate with Shreyan, but that is not what Shreyan wanted. Every time she would initiate being intimate with him, like even just like a kiss, like even just like a little bit of intimacy, he would push her away. He would shut her down. Shreyan told Annie that he did not believe in sex before marriage. Annie just felt really rejected. And Annie would talk to her sisters about this. And they would even like have these little debates, like trying to figure out like, was he even still a virgin? They just didn't know. They didn't know anything about him because Shreyan just didn't really open up about anything like that. He would just shut Annie down. At one point it got so bad that they weren't even sharing a bed and Shreyan went and slept on the sofa. And they were just continuing to argue all the time. Annie actually called off the wedding three separate times. So not just one time or anything like that, three separate times she called off the wedding and she threw her engagement ring back at Shreyan at one point as well. But each time Shreyan was able to talk Annie round. He said that it would be an embarrassment to the families if they called off the wedding which is never a good reason to get married. But this is what Shreyan would say to Annie. And he would tell Annie that both families had spent a ridiculous amount of money on this wedding and they both had to go through with it. And Annie just felt really bad. She felt really guilty because her parents had put a lot towards this wedding. And she felt really bad as well because she was having her wedding in India and lots of people had booked tickets and hotel rooms and everything to go for the wedding. And she just felt really bad that all of these people had dedicated their time and money into her wedding and she just didn't want to call it off. So in the end, Annie felt that she had no choice but to marry Shreyan. So on the 19th of October, 2010, 300 guests arrived in Mumbai, India for the wedding of Shreyan and Annie. And oh boy, was this a fancy wedding, but were we expecting anything less? Shreyan and Annie had spent approximately, because we don't know the exact figure, but it was around 200 thousand pounds. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Each to their own. If you have that amount of money, I suppose go ahead, but uh, 200,000 pounds on a wedding. The wedding celebrations took place over three days and the wedding celebrations took place in 
a beautiful location. Like it is, it was breathtaking. It was overlooking this huge lake outside Mumbai and the wedding celebrations included elephants. Like Shreyan came in on an elephant and the altar was designed to look like the Taj Mahal. Every single detail of this wedding had been thought out. Like everything was perfection. It was a very beautiful wedding and Annie in her bridal sari looked absolutely beautiful. And a lot of the guests as well said that it was the most fancy, lavish, luxurious wedding that they had ever been to. And surprisingly, there were no last minute dramas because I was expecting there to be drama, but no, everything seemed to go pretty smoothly. So now Annie and Shreyan were, I don't wanna say happily married couple, they were a married couple. And 10 days after they were married, they set off for their honeymoon in South Africa. So their honeymoon was kind of split into two different sections. So the first four days they spent on safari and they spent time in the national parks and everything. And Annie was texting her family just how happy she was. Like she was actually happy, like everything was going great. And then after the four days on safari, on the 12th of November, the couple headed to Cape Town. And it is unfortunate Unfortunately, in Cape Town where everything just went horribly wrong. So when they arrived in Cape Town, they were at the airport and Shreyan went outside to try and find a taxi. And this is when Shreyan meets taxi driver Zola Tongo. And this is very important. So take note of this. Zola is a very big character in today's story. So the couple get into Zola's taxi and they head straight to their hotel which was the Cape Grace, which is one of the best hotels in Cape Town. It is a five star luxury hotel. What else did we expect though? So when they got to the Cape Grace, the couple get out of the car, Annie heads straight into the hotel, but Shreyan kind of hangs back a little bit. He wanted to talk to Zola, the taxi driver alone. He basically asked Zola right there and then if he would be basically their personal chauffeur. And Zola agreed. He was like, yeah, I'll do whatever, whatever you need. So this was very weird, um, extremely weird because the hotel that Shreyan and Annie were staying at, five-star luxury hotel, they had their own car service. So why isn't Shreyan using the hotel's car service? We know he has enough money to use it. And Shreyan does like to live in luxury. He does like to show his wealth. He does like that luxurious lifestyle. So also, why wouldn't he use the five-star hotel's car service? Like why? Like why would he ask this random taxi driver who is driving a VW minivan, which there is nothing wrong with a VW minivan, okay? But I'm just saying Shreyan is used to driving Porsches, okay? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like why is he going to this random taxi driver for him to be his personal chauffeur when the hotel has a car service? Hmm. But for some reason, this is what Shreyan decides to do. So the next day, Shreyan and Annie spend most of the day by the pool in the hotel. And then on the evening, they got dressed up and they went down to the bar in the hotel just for some drinks. They're having a nice time. You can see them on CCTV. There's actually a lot of CCTV footage for this case, which is just really interesting. So you can see them on the CCTV. They're having drinks. They look like they're having a good time. Like, I know you can't really tell if they are, but they look like they are. They're having photos. After they have drinks, Zola is then waiting outside the hotel to take them for dinner. And the restaurant that the couple end up going to is on the other side of Cape Town. And the couple have dinner at this restaurant. And then at around 10.30 p.m., Zola is waiting outside of the restaurant to pick them up to take them back to the hotel. And this is where things take a turn for the worst. So apparently, and I wanna stress that very strongly. Apparently, when they were driving back to the hotel, Annie and Shreyan were talking to Zola and they were saying that they wanted to see the real South Africa. They wanted to stop seeing the Western side of South Africa and they wanted to see, quote, the real Africa. They wanted to see what life was like for the locals of South Africa. So apparently they asked for Zola to take them into one of the townships. And this is what Zola did. He drove them straight into the township of Gugulatu. Gugulatu is one of the poorest areas of South Africa. And the buildings are mostly just shanties that are made from just scrap pieces of wood and metal. It's also known as one of the most dangerous townships. It is known for its high incidence of assaults, 
hijacks, rapes, and murders. In fact, this small little township was averaging at about 140 murders a year at the time. And this is just a small little township. So it was kind of known that tourists uh, shouldn't really go in this area. Sometimes tourists would visit during the daytime hours, but never at night. Even the local residents would avoid going out in this township after dark. It was just known to be that dangerous. So it's just extremely unusual that the three of them were driving through Google 2 at nearly 11 p.m. I mean, you could understand that Shreyan and Annie, not being from South Africa, not being from the local area, may not have known this and may not have known how dangerous this particular township was, but Zola was a local. He would have known this and he should have said, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. Like, I don't think we should go into that township. But here they are, all three of them driving through Google or two. And unfortunately, this was not a good idea. So it was around 10.45 p.m. and the taxi approached a junction and a stop sign. So the car came to a stop. Annie and Shriam were just sat in the back of the taxi and they were looking around, just looking out the windows. When all of a sudden, two men rushed up to the vehicle and started banging on the windows. And one of them was holding a gun. And before anyone in the taxi knew it, the two men had just jumped into the car. One of the men jumped into the front of the car and almost pushed Zola out of the way, out of the driver's seat. And the other man jumped into the back of the car with Shreyan and Annie. So they forced Zola, the taxi driver, out of the car. At this point in the taxi, it is just the two hijackers and Annie and Shreyan in the car. A gun is being pointed at Annie and Shreyan and they're being shouted at by the two hijackers to lie down on the back seat, otherwise they will get shot. The gunman then demanded that Shreyan hand over his watch and his phone, which Shreyan did. And then the gunman told the couple that they were going to separate them. They told Annie and Shreyan that they were going to kick Shreyan out of the car first and then drive off for a little bit and then kick Annie out of the car second. Now, Annie and Shreyan were hysterical at this point, but they were now begging for them not to be separated. But the hijackers had made up their mind. They wanted, for some reason, to separate the couple and they had stopped the car and they were shouting a tree and get out get out, get out. So the hijackers pretty much forced Shreyan out of the car. They actually forced him out of the car window from the window that was smashed by the gun. So then they just left him and then they drove off and left Shreyan on the side of the road all alone. Shreyan didn't have his phone anymore because he had handed it over to the hijackers. So he literally just started wandering around, knocking on as many doors as he possibly could. So in the end, he does come across someone that will help him. So he phones the police. So the police go and pick Shreyan up. They also pick up the taxi driver who was kicked out of the car earlier on and the police take both Zola and Shreyan back to the hotel and they continue on looking for Annie. It's at this point when Shreyan returns to the hotel that he calls Annie's dad and tells him about the absolutely horrific news that Annie has been kidnapped. Now Annie's dad Vinod is trying to stay calm and he's trying to calm down Shreyan at this point and he's trying to tell him like don't worry we'll get Annie back. They clearly just want money. We'll pay them whatever they want. It's all going to be okay. But inside, of course, he's panicking and he does get onto the next flight to South Africa. So the search for Annie went on throughout the night and into the next morning and no progress had really been made. And then it was 8 a.m. in the morning of the next day when the police received a phone call from a local resident. A resident said that there was an abandoned VW minivan just outside of where they lived. And where the call came from was roughly about 20 minutes away from where Annie and Shreyan first got home. Hijacked. So the police are like, okay, this seems like it may be the taxi we're looking for. It matches the description and everything. So the police go out and investigate the VW minivan. And this is when they make the absolute horrific discovery of Annie's body. They found Annie's body on the back seat of the minivan. And tragically, it was too late. She had been shot and the wound was fatal. And heartbreakingly, Annie was pronounced dead at the scene. So the police got in contact with Annie's dad, Renard, who is on his way to South Africa. And he he got the call in between two of these connecting flights and for him to hear the news of his daughter's death over the phone and then he has to get on a plane it's it's absolutely horrible. So of course, originally the police were investigating a kidnapping, a hijacking. Well, it now turned into a murder investigation and the police knew that they needed to find the two men that hijacked the car. And luckily they did find some prints 
on the inside of the VW minivan. One of the prints belonged to a 26 year old man, Umgaini, and the police immediately went to his house to arrest him. And when they arrived at Umgaini's house to arrest him, he was lying in bed with a man and two women after a night full of partying. So the police had to literally drag him out of bed. They read him his rights and they arrested him. And when he got to the police station, Umgaini pretty much confessed to the murder straight away. He wasn't hiding it. He was like, yeah, okay, I did it. I was the murderer. But he wasn't going to go down alone and he immediately gave up his accomplice who was 26 year old Kwabe. So the police go and arrest Kwabe and they now have the two hijackers in custody. And the police at this point are probably thinking, ah, case solved. We have the two hijackers. One of them has admitted to the murder. Case solved but it wasn't that simple. So when Kwabe was interviewed about his involvement, he admitted to his involvement. He was like, yeah, I was involved, but he made a bombshell. He said, but I was ordered by somebody else to do this. Kwabe said that he had received a call from a third man, Umblombo, and Umblombo had told Kwabe that he needed someone to carry out a hijacking. So the police are like, oh my God, how many people are involved in this hijacking? So the police go and now arrest this third man that is involved, Umblombo. So the police now interview Umblombo and guess what? <laughs> This is where it starts to get confusing because there are so many people involved. So Umblombo said that he was ordered by somebody else to arrange this whole hijacking. And guess who he said ordered him to do this? Zola Tongo, the taxi driver. So I feel like I have to break it down because it is very confusing because we have just introduced quite a few new characters. So apparently Zola Tongo phoned his friend Umblombo and was like, hey, I need some people to carry out a hijacking. And Umblombo was like, okay, I think I have two people in mind. So then Umblombo phoned Kwabe and said to Kwabe, I need someone to carry out a hijacking. Can you do this? Kwabe was like, yes, I can do this. And I also have a friend that can help me who was Umgaini. So hopefully that makes sense now because I know we did just introduce a lot of characters all at once. And the police are like, oh my God, what the hell is this turning into? This is turning into such a bigger thing. How many more people could be involved? So the police keep all four men in custody while the investigation is happening. Shrian at this point has returned back to the UK and on the 20th of November, so this is six days after Annie's murder, it was Annie's funeral. Her funeral took place in London and over 1,500 people attended. And it was an incredibly sad event. Annie was loved by so many people. However, at the funeral and in the days leading up to the funeral, a lot of people couldn't help but feel that Shrian was acting very weirdly. Everybody handles things in their own way and you can't really judge people for how they want to grieve but his actions, they're weird, okay? They're just weird. So the night before Annie's funeral, Shrian held a pizza party. Now I'm all for a pizza party, but time and a place, I don't really think the day before your wife's funeral is the appropriate time for a pizza party. And a lot of other people as well, including Annie's father, Vinod, found this just very distasteful, very disrespectful and inappropriate. What is just really weird as well is that Shrian tried to prevent members of Annie's family from spending time alone with Annie's casket. Don't know why. I can't explain that. Like, why? Like, I just don't, I don't know, but he was just being weird. There are just a few other things as well that are a little bit questionable. Like, Shrian was always seen laughing and smiling. He was also being very distant to Annie's family. Annie's grandmother, so Vinod's mom, always listened to the nan, always listened to the grandmother, okay? They always know. She was being extra watchful of Shrian. She was keeping a close eye on him. And she noticed whenever Shrian would talk about the events of the night that Annie was murdered, his story would always slightly change. Just little details, like the tiny little details that most people probably wouldn't pick up on. Well, she picked up on it and she was like, why is his story always changing? And Annie's grandmother was voicing this to Vinod. She was like, uh, this is weird, this is suspicious, but Vinod, he obviously doesn't want to think that his son-in-law is involved in his daughter's murder. So he was just saying to his mom, like, listen, it's nothing, calm down. You're being a little bit paranoid. Like don't talk like that. But once this was brought to Vernard's attention, he couldn't help but start to see all of these weird things himself. And he started to think, 
maybe my mom is right. So then on the morning of the 7th of December 2010, this is around three weeks after the murder, a court hearing is held in Cape Town. And at this point, the murder of Annie was a huge story. It was a huge story all over the world. It was in the media constantly, especially in the UK and South Africa. I think what gripped people the most was that it was two tourists that had been targeted and it was a tourist that had been murdered whilst they were on their honeymoon. So for this court hearing that was happening in Cape Town, Annie's dad, Bernard, had traveled to South Africa for this hearing and this hearing was being held because Zola wanted to make a statement the taxi driver. So everyone had gathered in the courtroom, all of the journalists, everything for this statement. It was like, what is Zola Tonga gonna say? And Zola's statement was read out. It was pretty short, it was pretty simple. And it basically just said, Annie's murder was no accident. It was arranged by her husband, Shrian. That's right, Zola is now accusing Shrian of organizing this whole thing. As you can imagine, there was an audible gasp in that courtroom because nobody was expecting that. Zola said that after they met at the airport, Shrian approached Zola about arranging the murder of his wife. He told Zola that he would pay him 15,000 Rand, which is equivalent of around $2,000, to carry this out. And following this, Zola then went about making the arrangements for Annie's murder. So Shrian is back in the UK when all of this comes out and <laughs> immediately he is arrested. Shrian spent two days in custody before posting bail at 250,000 pounds. I know, so much money. And Shrian went back to live in the family home in Bristol. And this is when the investigation into Shrian really started to escalate. A lot of questions started to rise about lots of different things because let's be honest, there are a lot of suspicious things that happen in this case. First major question that everyone wanted answering is why the hell were they driving through such a dangerous township at night. Why did Shrian agree to allow this to happen? Like this just wasn't normal. Tourists did not go into the townships at night. Like this just didn't happen. So why in this case did it happen? Like why did Shrian want to go into a township? And a lot of people thought that it supported the theory of Shrian arranging the hit on his wife. So another question that a lot of people wanted to know the answer to was let's just say that Shrian wasn't involved in any of this at all. Why was Shrian and the taxi driver allowed to live? Like if neither one of them was involved in this hit, why did they survive? Like why was Annie targeted? Why was Annie murdered? If these two random gunmen saw this as a crime of opportunity, saw this car pull up at this stop sign and thought, you know what? Let's hijack this car. Why would they only murder Annie? Why would they not murder everyone to not leave witnesses? Or why would they not just let everyone go? Like, it doesn't make sense, does it? Theory to explain this was thrown out there that the two hijackers may have been planning a rape and that is why they threw the taxi driver and Shrian out of the car. But there were no signs of any sexual assault on Annie's body. So this theory was immediately thrown out. Another really strange thing, which to me is one of the strangest things about this whole case. So Annie, when she was in the car, she was wearing her 25,000 pound engagement ring and Annie's engagement ring was still in the taxi. The hijackers had not taken it. If this was just a hijacking, a robbery gone wrong, why would they leave a £25,000 engagement ring? Why would they do that? They wouldn't. They, they just simply wouldn't do that. Also, the car was just left abandoned. If it was a robbery, a hijacking, why wouldn't they steal the car, sell it for parts, sell it on? Why wouldn't they do that? None of this makes any sense. And another question a lot of people had was why the hell was Shrian so friendly with this random taxi driver that he had just met? Like I said earlier on, why was Shrian even using a random taxi? Like why? He could have used the hotel car service. Let's just pretend that Shrian hadn't arranged a car service. So he got off the plane at the airport and he was like, oh crap, we need to get to the hotel and I haven't arranged a car service. I'm gonna have to go and find a random taxi now. Let's just play devil's advocate, okay? And pretend that that is what happened. So Shrian goes out and finds a taxi. 
he finds Zola. Zola takes them to the hotel. But why does Shrian continue on using Zola when the hotel have a car service and Shrian is loaded? He can afford it. He likes living the life of luxury. He likes using things like a car service. So why wouldn't he do it on his honeymoon? I'm sorry, but this is just all incredibly suspicious. And Zola said that Shrian had only continued to use Zola's taxi service so they could both arrange Annie's murder. Zola gave a full account of what his versions of events were. So he said once he dropped Annie and Shrian off at the Hotel Cape Grace the first time, Annie went into the hotel and Shrian came back out and spoke to Zola alone. And it was at this point that Shrian had asked Zola about arranging the murder of his wife, Annie. And you can see this on CCTV. You can see Shrian coming back out of the hotel and speaking to Zola on his own. And Shrian was speaking to Zola for 10 minutes. What do you need to speak to a taxi driver for? For 10 minutes. Like, 10 minutes, that's a very long time. Zola said that it was at this point that Shrian had offered him 15,000 Rand to organize the murder of his wife, Annie. And Zola said that this is why they were talking for so long because of all of the details that they needed to go over about the murder. There is also CCTV footage of Shrian just before the murder of Annie going to withdraw a large amount of cash. Again, the questions arose. Why is Shrian withdrawing so much cash? And something that definitely supported Zola's version of events was the sheer amount of texts and phone calls between Shrian and Zola in the 24 hours leading up to Annie's murder. However, unfortunately, the police could see how many texts were exchanged between the two, but unfortunately, what was said in the text messages was never recovered. And this to me is so suspicious. It's like, who the hell texts and phones their taxi driver so many times. It's like, if you do have to communicate with the taxi driver, it's always very short and it's always like, yeah, I need picking up from here, this time, blah, blah, blah. Oh, how much is that? Oh, okay, thank you, bye. Like, you know what I mean? Like phone calls with taxi drivers don't exactly last for very long and you may text them, oh, this is the directions or this is the address or blah, 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 but you don't send that many text messages, it's like, what were they talking about? And I'm sorry if it feels like I'm just listing it off one by one, but there are so many things that are just so suspicious in this case and definitely point towards Shrian's guilt. So another thing that definitely looks suspicious was on the night before the murder, Shrian and Annie were out for dinner. In the middle of dinner, Shrian is just like, oh, I need to make a work call. And I've also left my phone in the hotel room. I'm just gonna have to go back and get it. You're on your honeymoon. <laughs> and you're going to leave your new wife at dinner on her own so you can make a phone call. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. So Shrian leaves the dinner with Annie, leaves Annie in the restaurant angry. Shrian returns to the hotel, goes to his phone, and phone records show that there was a message waiting for him from Zola on his phone. Why is the taxi driver messaging him? Uh huh. It's almost like Shrian knew that there was going to be a message there waiting for him. And all of this can be seen on CCTV. So when Shrian sees the message from Zola, he then phones him up and speaks to him for five minutes. Again, what the hell are you talking about? It's like you've just left your wife at dinner. She's sat on her own. You're currently on your honeymoon and you're in a different location speaking to a taxi driver. I know that that doesn't equal guilt, I know, but that definitely makes him a shitty person. I don't care. But this is not the only weird thing. There are so many weird things with the texts and calls between Shrian and Zola. Phone records also showed that when all three of them were in the car on the night of the murder, on the night of the hijacking, Shrian and Zola were texting each other whilst they were in the same car. Why? Why? What were they talking about? They were clearly talking about something that they didn't want Annie to know about. Who texts their taxi driver when they're in the same car as the taxi driver? I'm sorry, I've never heard of that happening before. Again, the contents of these messages were never recovered, so we don't know what was in those text messages. But let's just face it, it doesn't look good, does it? It doesn't. Like, who the hell texts their taxi driver whilst they are in the car with the taxi driver? And finally, there was more suspicious CCTV footage after Annie's murder. So in one recording, Shrian is talking to Zola the morning after Annie's murder. All of a sudden, Shrian looks up 
directly at the camera and definitely starts acting a little shifty. It's like, why all of a sudden did you look up at the camera? Hmm? Why? Zola said that in this footage, Shrian had gone up to Zola and asked him if the job was done. And Zola said, you need to be careful what you ask me because there's cameras. And after Zola said about the cameras, this is when Shrian looked up at the cameras. Now, this next thing that I'm going to tell you is in my opinion, the most damning piece of evidence because everything that I have said so far is suspicious, definitely looks guilty, it doesn't look good, but it still does not prove anything, especially because we don't have the contents of those text messages. But this next part, it's definitely in my opinion, the most damning piece of evidence. So Shrian on CCTV is seen meeting up with Zola three days after the murder of Annie. It's like, why are you still in contact with this taxi driver? Like, why are you still meeting up with him? But the most suspicious part of this meeting is that Shrian is seen holding a white envelope. He enters a hotel room and when he leaves that hotel room, he does not have the white envelope with him anymore. Zola is then seen leaving the hotel with that white envelope. And the police believe that this envelope contains the money, the 15,000 Rand that Shrian had said that he would give Zola for arranging the murder of his wife. Following this little meeting with Zola, Shrian left South Africa and returned back to the UK as fast as possible. Shrian has tried to explain what this whole white envelope situation was. And Shrian said that he was meeting up with Zola because he still owed him money for his taxi services. And it's like, okay, all right, sure. So yeah, there are a lot of things that <laughs> don't look good, but a lot of people were still asking why? Like, what was Shrian's motive? He wouldn't gain financially from Annie's death, which is a lot of times the motive behind these kinds of killings. There was definitely signs that possibly both of them were unhappy in the relationship. That could be a motive. Well, it actually turns out that a pretty strong motive did become clear. So a few weeks after the murder, a man called Leopold Lyser got in touch with the police. Leopold was a male escort and he went by the name, the German master. And it turns out that Shrian was a client of his. So in the month leading up to the wedding, Shrian had paid Leopold, the German master, for three sessions. Leopold told the police that Shrian liked to dress up in leather. He liked s &M. He liked to be dominated. And Leopold wasn't the only person that came forward about Shrian's sexuality. Quite a few people did come forward that they had had encounters with Shrian in gay bars around London. Now again, does this say motive? I don't know, but... Get this. So Leopold told the police that Shrian had confided in him about the wedding and he had told Leopold that he needed to find a way out of this marriage. But Shrian was worried about his family disowning him if he did. It also came out that Shrian had visited quite frequently the website Gaydar and in Shrian's history, it showed that he was visiting this site in the days leading up to Annie's murder, but also the day after her murder. It's like, do what you want to do, you know, I don't care, but your wife has just been murdered. Shouldn't your mind be preoccupied on other things? And when all of these details about Shrian's sex life, about his secret sex life, everyone went crazy. The media went crazy. So people now believed that Shrian was hiding his true sexuality and that was his motive behind getting his wife murdered. Others did speculate that maybe Annie found out about his sexuality. Maybe she found out on the honeymoon and this is why he got her murdered. I don't believe that one. Like, I don't know, who knows? Maybe Annie knew about his sexuality. We cannot say. And Annie's family were absolutely devastated when they heard this news because they were just absolutely heartbroken that Shrian would go behind their daughter's back the way he did. And this as well was just one more piece of evidence that proved to them that Shrian was involved in their daughter's murder. But not everyone thought that Shrian was guilty. Quite a few people did start speaking out in his defense and started to say that there is not enough evidence. There's no clear evidence to to prove that he was involved. One of the strongest arguments in his support to prove his innocence was that, was it really plausible for Shrian and Annie to arrive in South Africa, then arrive in Cape Town, and Shrian in that moment arrange 
a hit on his wife. I mean, if you think about it, they arrived in Cape Town and within 24 hours, Annie was murdered. That is a very quick turnaround if you are going to arrange a hit on someone. And also, what are the chances that Shrian went up to the first taxi driver that he saw and this taxi driver just so happens to be able to help him with a murder. And I can understand this argument, I can. It doesn't really seem plausible, does it? Not that I know how long it takes to arrange a hit on someone, unfortunately. I think it's probably quicker than we think, but it still seems kind of far-fetched when you actually think about it like that. And then there's also the question of all of the money and the phone calls, because the fact that Shrian had so much money on him, the fact that he withdrew that large amount of money, and then also the fact that he was constantly calling and texting his taxi driver definitely looks guilty. Well, Shrian had an answer to all of this. He said that he was trying to arrange a surprise helicopter ride for Annie. And this is why he needed a large amount of money to pay for this helicopter ride. And this is why he was constantly phoning and texting the taxi driver because he was going through the taxi driver to arrange this helicopter ride. Why are you going through your taxi driver to arrange that? That does not make sense. I feel like I need to stress again. He is staying in a five-star hotel they have the ability to do this for you. And I did see a member of staff at the Cape Grace Hotel saying that they've done this plenty of times for many guests. They have arranged helicopter rides and they can do it in a matter of like five minutes. So again, why are you using your taxi driver? A lot of people also argued that the witnesses in this case were not the most reliable. So that is Zola, Mgeni, Mblombo and Kwabe. So a lot of people think that the other men that were involved in this murder are not the most reliable witnesses because they all initially did not point the finger at Shrian. None of them once in their initial statement said Shrian did it, Shrian is the one responsible, he is the one that organized it. None of them said any of that. All of a sudden, like two weeks after they were arrested, three of them changed their statement to then accuse Shrian of being involved. And three of them were offered plea deals, reduced sentences in exchange for their testimony against Shrian. So you can understand why people think that they're not the most reliable witnesses. And then there was even some speculation that the South African government were motivated to try and pin this crime on Shrian because it would look bad for South African tourism. Because if it was found that locals had murdered a woman while she was on holiday in South Africa, that would give a bad reputation to South Africa, that would affect tourism. And that is why the South African government wanted to pin it and blame it on Shrian. So yeah, this case, it's got a lot of avenues. It's very confusing. It's very, very complex. But anyway, the pressure is really building up on Shrian. Remember that currently he's still actually in the UK. He's just out on bail. Well, there are a lot of calls to get him extradited back to South Africa to stand trial. But there was kind of a problem with this because in February 2011, an ambulance was called to Shrian's family's home. Shrian had taken an overdose of sleeping medication and he had told many people that he didn't want to live anymore. Shrian was then diagnosed with severe depression and PTSD. He was then committed into the Priory Hospital in London under the Mental Health Act. He was essentially sectioned. And because of this, it was declared that he was not fit enough to stand trial for the murder of Annie. But the South African government wanted him to stand trial. They wanted him to answer all of these questions that were unanswered. But because of Shrian's illnesses, the extradition just kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And as everything kept getting pushed back and pushed back, Shrian was actually photographed in London quite a few times outliving his life. And a few people were accusing him of faking his illnesses, which I'm not going to say he was. I'm not, but that's what other people were saying. And then Theresa May got involved and she ordered the extradition of Shrian back to South Africa to stand trial. So after a very, very long battle on the 7th of April, 2014, over three years after Annie's murder, Shrian was back in South Africa to stand trial. And whilst this battle about Shrian's extradition was going on, because obviously that took a very long time, the other men that were involved in this case were sentenced. So Zola Tongo, the taxi driver, he did have a plea deal where he agreed to his involvement in the murder and also to testify that Shrian was involved. He would get a reduced sentence. So Zola has been sentenced to 18 years in prison. Umblombo, who was the middleman between Zola and the hijackers, was actually 
actually given full immunity if he admitted his involvement in the crime, but also if he testified against Shreyan. Kwabe, one of the hijackers, was given a plea deal if he admitted his involvement in the murder and also testified against Shreyan, and he was given a 25-year sentence. Umgaini was never given a plea deal. I don't know why, he was the only one that wasn't given any kind of deal and he actually pleaded not guilty to the crime as well. So he did go to trial, he was the only one that went to trial in 2012 and he was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. And then on the 6th of October 2014, it was the start of Shreyan's trial. And as you can imagine, there was so much interest in this trial all around the world, but especially in the UK and South Africa, everyone was speculating, is he guilty, is he not? So Shreyan was charged with conspiracy to murder, along with five other charges, and he pleaded not guilty to all of them. The start of the trial really focused on Shreyan's sexuality. The prosecution wanted to argue that Shreyan's sexuality was the motive behind the murder. And pretty much the entire case that the prosecution had was based around Shreyan's sexuality. And then a huge shock came from the defense on the first day. So the defense read out a statement from Shreyan and in the statement, Shreyan came out and admitted that he was bisexual and he admitted to having encounters with male escorts. And this was a huge shock to everyone because everyone was expecting Shreyan to deny all of these rumors. And the defense said that Shreyan's sexuality should have nothing to do with the trial and that any evidence around Shreyan's sexuality should be inadmissible. And the judge agreed. The judge agreed that Shreyan's sexuality should not be brought into the trial. And like I said, the prosecution's whole case was pretty much surrounding Shreyan's sexuality. So they kind of had nothing. It's like, come on, you can't base your whole case on one thing. Ugh. Pretty much the rest of the trial focused on the testimony from Zola Tongo because he was the only one out of the other four involved that actually had contact with Shreyan. So Zola gave his version of events with all of the CCTV, like saying everything that happened and all of the texts and the phone calls and the money, everything. Zola spent five days being cross-examined by the defense. That is so long. And the longer he was on the stand, the more inconsistencies kept coming up in his story. And he started telling slightly different versions of the story each time. And as time went on, he was just looking more and more like an unreliable witness. And because of this, because Zola was contradicting himself and just because he wasn't making anything clear, the defense argued that this whole case should be thrown out because literally it has no evidence, it has no basis, and they have no reliable witnesses. And it turns out the judge agreed again, and the whole case was thrown out. And the judge said that they were disappointed in the weak case that the prosecution had brought forward. Mr. Tonga, who was the only witness who could link the accused to the conspiracy, gave evidence to the court which is so improbable and contains so many mistakes, lies, and inconsistency that one simply cannot know where the lies end and where the truth begins. So in the end, Shreyan was found not guilty. He didn't even take the stand because obviously the case was thrown out before he could. And at the end of the day, that is all Annie's family wanted. They wanted Shreyan to take the stand. They wanted to hear it from his own mouth under oath what happened that night. And following the trial, a formal complaint was actually made against the judge in that trial, accusing her of being biased towards the defense. And that is why she threw the case out. Shreyan was obviously found not guilty and he was just able to go on and continue living his life as a free man. There have been reports that he is living in a three million pound apartment in London with his new partner. And there are a lot of controversy that surrounds this case still today. People are outraged that he never gave a full account of what happened. And I can understand that. Regardless of what you think, regardless of whether you think he's guilty or not guilty, he has never fully been able to explain and give answers that are good enough to a lot of the things that are surrounding this case, a lot of the suspicions that a lot of people have of him. And there are many people, I should probably say there are a lot of people, that still today think Shreyan is guilty for the murder of Annie. So I wanna know all of your thoughts, even though I think I have a pretty good idea what you all think. <laughs>
<laughs> but I want to hear all of your thoughts. I mean, he was found not guilty. His case was thrown out because there wasn't enough evidence. There wasn't enough to prosecute him, to even go to trial. So he's not guilty. But just because you are found not guilty in a trial, that doesn't necessarily mean innocence. But the most devastating thing that has come out of this case is that Annie's family still do not have answers. They still don't exactly know what happened to Annie. I have watched quite a few things on this case now, and I have watched quite a few of Annie's family members talk on this case, and it is very obvious how deeply they cared for Annie, and my heart goes out to them. Annie was taken from this world far too soon. I just hate that the family doesn't have answers, and I really hope that one day they do get answers. I don't know how, but I just hope that one day they do get answers and hopefully that will give them some kind of closure. So let me know all of your thoughts, theories, and opinions down below. Do you understand now why I said we all need our detective hats on for this case? Because there are no answers. I am left with more questions than answers after doing my research on this case. Thank you again to Hunter Killer for sponsoring today's video and let me know all of your case suggestions in the comments because I always wanna know what you wanna hear next and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.